seen over there, um, which is um, which could be used in arsenic uh, removal. And the cost comparison was, uh, of course, great. Uh, $2,600 per kilogram went down to $22 per kilogram. And and you have to uh, realize that I'm charging even for rust. So uh, imagine you have edible oil at home, uh, some potash instead of crystal vinegar or, or vinegar. So these are all uh, kitchen-made chemicals that you can employ in, in your reaction. Um, so how do I take lessons out of this? Um, so I have to go back to open source concept. And, and there are several people working to advance the open source into sciences. It's, it's a slow pace, but there are some progresses. For example, there's a case study. Uh, there's, a, there's a disease which is caused by a worm, which goes under the skin and, and lays its eggs, and it becomes really trouble for the human beings who are carrying it. Uh, less mortality, but very uh, so, sort of physiological uh, effects. But uh, what, what the, prob the problem was, uh, uh, cutting down the cost of this drug. This drug is 7 cents per 600 milligram tablet and also they were trying to get one enantiomer it's, it's basically one form of the molecule uh, not the other so uh, what they did was they put everything every information about uh, this this drug online so that different research groups around the world can come together and sort of build this technology and solve the problem and, and, and you can see a lot of trouble about the patent ownership, who is going to make money out of this, what about the drug companies, everything. But these are really uh, sort of breakthrough in terms of thinking. Because in, in software, it's relatively easy. You don't, uh, it's just computers and you, right? You just write the code. Uh, well, of course, there's time you're investing. But it's rather easy to, to make something open source than science. And in sciences, you spend a lot of money developing a drug. And, and, and what? You're going to give it a free? So it's kind of it's a little hard. But somebody actually is doing it. And what I'd like to uh, take out of it is, is that we are trying to push the same concept with our particles. Because imagine we were uh, designing them for the use in, in Southeast Asia anyway, right? The poor countries. So we want them to make themselves the, the particles and then use it themselves. So we're not gonna, we cannot own anything out of this. So we <coughs> actually are licensing uh, this technology to be free. So we, we're patenting it so that nobody else can make money out of it. Um, so long story short, we are building a lot of uh, sort of leadership in this area. Um, so I'll, I'll connect with the CO2 with, with my remaining two minutes. Uh, CO2 project that I'm involved with, which I, I'm trying to develop a method that uh, produces a powder that could be spread out underneath the forest or plantation, which is similar to greenhousing in the farm industry, which you load up a greenhouse with a whole bunch of plants and you just uh, put in a lot of CO2. Uh, basically, in the, during the life, the, the magic powder would release CO2 and in the evening, it, kind of uh, pulls back the CO2 back into the uh, solid. So I'm, I'm working on the details um, um, and some, some analysis. So this is uh, a time, so each noon you have a spike in CO2 concentration. So it gives away, it's a proof of the concept, it gives away CO2 uh, in the levels. And this is the magic powder that I'm working on right now, which gi is giving um, it, about 600 ppm levels, which is twice as much as the atmospheric CO2, which means that this will work because it's going to produce a lot of CO2. It will be taken by the plants, and in the night, these magic powders will be attracting more CO2 onto themselves. So, um, and the idea is, is again in the open source concept that the zinc and magnesium is, is relatively easier to find than any other substances on the planet. Um, so, uh, sort of. My last slide um, is about my other project, again dealing with the CO2, uh, which is basically hydrotolicides. It's a, it's a sort of advanced chemical, but I'm making them with also uh, household chemicals, which is anti-acid and uh, base baking soda, and, and we were able to pull it off uh, in a good uh, uh, sort of crystallization. So it, uh, as a summary, we can say uh, that it is possible to turn very high-tech technologies into open-source concepts so that everybody can benefit out of this. I think one of the great challenges 
about the clean energy and environment is the ownership. Like those big companies are trying to make the, the money. They don't care about the environment, uh, to, to be honest. And I'm sure somebody else will address that too. So why not just take it to the individuals who can make the difference as they did in the other areas? And I'd like to thank my PhD advisor, Vicky, Galen, and a whole bunch of other people, and my son, and, and thank you for listening. It's uh, fun to be here. It was a good session this morning. I hope we can uh, piggyback on that. Um, here's the title of the whole day and last night, Social Challenges of the 21st Century, the Roles of Government, Civil Society, Media, and Education. Can you hear me fine? No, I won't worry. This is certainly energy, cleaner energy, and environmental issues are certainly qualified for this title. Uh, if you put the third one in there, economics, energy, environment, economics, the combination of those three will be a major global challenge throughout the 21st century. There's no doubt about it. And they're all three often so closely connected that you can't talk about one without the other two. So uh, what I'd like to do in my 10 minutes is to set the stage for the other two papers, one on biofuels and one on wind and water power, uh, two of the alternatives being proposed to fossil fuel and being developed all over the, the world and in the United States. Uh, as alternatives to the continued use of fossil fuel. Um, when, when you look at the media and education part, let me ask a question. How many of you sitting here today believe that you're fairly well educated about energy? That you say you're capable of voting intelligently when you start screaming at Congress of the equivalent of the health bill, which is the cap and trade bill that is sitting in, a, in limbo now with the election day before yesterday. And probably after all that uh, motion will not be passed. How many think you could vote intelligently as a congressman? How many think your congressman can vote intelligently on energy? <laughs> Compared to health care even. It's, it's a very complex issue. We've, we've had the luxury in the United States of leaving this issue alone for most of our history because the, the system that we had delivered increasingly lower cost energy and we quit worrying about it. Unfortunately, the, the, that, those days are over. And the other thing our fossil fuel system delivered, we now understand, is increasing environmental degradation. Uh, uh, the way we, we set costs for energy throughout the 20th century into the 1970s at least, was to treat environmental impacts as externalities and play like they didn't exist. And by the 60s and 70s, it became clear we couldn't do that anymore. That, that, the, that the problems were, were no longer invisible. You can see them in, this, in Houston. When I was an undergraduate rice in the 60s, the, the air was regularly yellow. Uh, driving in, and it was a lot worse in New York City and Los Angeles at that time. So let me uh, set up this a little bit, how we got so dependent on fossil fuels. I do want to at least address, as I sit down, the point made earlier this morning about the, the issues of justice around climate change. I think that's a good uh, starting point of, to get to alternative fuels. We became very reliant on fossil fuels, first coal, then oil, then natural gas, because they're very good fuels. They were cheap. They were more flexible than anything else in the world at the time for 100 years. And we gradually, steadily built our understanding of how to use them. We constructed infrastructure that could use them. We built roads. We built cars to burn gasoline. We learned how to make electricity from coal and natural gas. Uh, these were very good fuels in the context of their long run as the dominant energy supply, not just in the US, but in the whole developed world. Uh, today, as we sit here, the best guess is that fossil fuels still produce perhaps as much as 80% of the world's primary energy. Um, oil around 35% uh, of that and a little less from coal and a little less from a, a, a now fairly rapidly growing natural gas supply. Um, there might have been logical reasons to use them economically in energy. The environmental costs, uh, as I've said, couldn't be ignored forever. As to the national security cost, particularly as we became increasingly dependent on Middle Eastern oil, which we could no longer depend on to be a source of sturdy and inexpensive energy. So 
I'm sitting here thinking of the, the younger men starting a career. When I was a young man once, I was teaching at the University of California, Berkeley in the 1970s in something called the Energy and Resources Group. Uh, and with the same questions we're talking about today, the same problems, almost, uh, you could almost reprint the congressional hearings. We went through the 1970s in this country. Uh, I think the best conclusion, we didn't do anything about it of substance other than create a strategic petroleum reserve and oil on the ground along the Gulf Coast to use it as the next embargo. So we're revisiting those questions. And I think what it tells us is a very pessimistic thing. It tells us that our political system in the U.S. is very ill-suited for dealing with this kind of a complex problem in the long term. We need to, to do this. Uh, the Japanese have been much better, for example, because they have a consensus that the government has some intelligence to do these things and has a record of doing some of these hard things over time. We don't trust our government to do that. Our government in the U.S. is structured in a way that makes it very difficult to do that. And here we are again, uh, and one thing happening underneath uh, both, uh, the academic career of one of the speakers and the, and the professional career of the others is that just as in the 70s, the danger is as oil and gas prices go up and down, when they come back down low, the alternatives have a hard time existing, establishing themselves. Long way to go. <clears throat> okay, so we're switching from fossil fuels, we think. Uh, we probably need to, national security, the cost, the environmental impact, uh, the a very high social cost. The emerging debates become alternative fuels and the questions that we don't know how to ask politically, alternatives to what? To oil, to natural gas, uh, renewables, wh what are we looking for and can we uh, find the political will to actually end the economic incentives uh, to move from fossil fuels gradually, steadily towards something else. Um, many people are betting their lives that we can. A lot of money might be made and a lot of money might just as easily be lost in the quest to build these other alternatives. Uh, and it is, it's an uphill battle. It, it was in the 70s, it still is. So this much political conflict already occurred and will continue to occur when the, when the health care bill gets pushed aside, the cap and trade bill will come up quickly and it'll get pushed aside and we'll start over that debate, I do believe. So let me, uh, I'm gonna get uh, my take on this and it'll be very different from the other two speakers. I wanna make four points and I'll state them simply and if you wanna talk about them, we can talk about it or you can find me after the session. <coughs> if, there, if we are moving toward alternative energies, we need to understand it's a long transition away from fossil fuel. Maybe in the U.S. and Europe and Japan, two generations. In China and India, maybe 100 years. A long transition. That's good news for Houston, maybe bad news for the environment. But what that means is there's a pressing need to do what these two speakers are going to talk about, but also to find ways to use to make oil and natural gas in particular, and even coal, cleaner or as clean as we can. And that's worth spending money on, and money is being spent on that now. I want to stress that we're not talking about clean energy, we're talking about cleaner. And a, a lesson of history, which I've, I've studied the 1970s forward a long time, but even back in, in, the, in the more distant past, a lesson of history is that any alternative to oil and gas and coal that is used at a level that will make a difference will have unforeseen environmental impacts. We might as well know that before we start. Uh, millions of wind turbines are obvious, you can see them. Uh, biofuels, uh, ethanol and the impact on farm prices and things. These impacts are going to be there for any fuel that makes a big enough contribution to back out significant fossil fuels. That's just the reality of how much fossil fuel we use today. <coughs> uh, Nuclear is a good example. We don't know what to do with the waste yet, although other countries have. Um, and the politics, I want to, I can't help this because I'm a, I'm a my favorite president, believe it or not, was Jimmy Carter. I'm the only person left who thinks Jimmy Carter was one of the great presidents. He tried using the phrase, the moral equivalent of war, to talk about the politics of energy. And he found out, as we will all find out, there is no moral equivalent of war in politics. War creates consensus. You can get drafted in a war. You can get put in jail for not going to the army. There's no equivalent to a war on energy or environment that, that makes any political sense to use that phrase. Um, it, it, it hasn't worked. We have to find the political will to do this somewhere short of war. And it is a national security issue. That's, that's, that's one thing that can happen over this issue. On climate change, I want to close. And I think I can't uh, teach a class on climate change today, but uh, the idea is that fossil fuel isn't the cause of climate change, but is the, the most, it's the most obvious and manageable human cause. 
So it's one thing we can do something about. Uh, the, you know, the different political impulses that, have, that the U.S. has stayed outside of is trying to do that, the Kyoto Protocol. When you talk about justice,